Living in a rural corner of Utah, amidst densely populated counties, has its eerie moments, especially when you're in a career that's been more of a nightmare than a dream. Despite my best efforts to choose safe paths, my journey led me away from finance into the realm of security. Little did I know, my definition of security would soon be turned on its head. Leaving the world of numbers behind, I found myself as a predator control officer for the county. Now, before your mind wanders, it's not the kind of predators you'd expect, not the human kind, but the ones with fur and claws. Coyotes, to be precise, were the primary target due to their overpopulation wreaking havoc on our rural community. But mountain lions and even bears occasionally crossed our paths. Applying for the job was easy enough, and the absence of probing questions about the sudden departure of the previous employee didn't raise many red flags, especially considering the meager pay. But hey, it was a change of pace, and I found solace in the great outdoors. Initially, the job was mundane, routine even. Dispatch calls for coyotes harassing livestock or sneaking into homes were the norm. That is, until one incident shook me to the core. It was my tenth outing when things took a turn. A pack of coyotes terrorizing a local apple farm, preying on goats and sheep, caught my attention. This farm, nestled at the base of a mountain range, was a serene oasis in the rural landscape. But beneath its tranquil facade lurked something sinister. Driving through the snow-laden orchard, I found myself stuck, yet again, in the relentless blizzard that had been tormenting us for months. But this day was different. The snowfall was gentle, almost serene, with no chilling gusts from the nearby canyon. Armed with my trusty AR-15, camouflaged to match the snowy terrain, I set out to confront the coyote menace. As I trudged through the powdery snow, the landscape transformed into a winter wonderland. The orchard stretched before me, the distant trees obscured by the falling snowflakes. Positioning myself behind a snow-covered log, I waited, my senses on high alert. Minutes stretched into eternity before movement caught my eye. Flicking on my specialized optic, I expected to see coyotes prowling the fields. Instead, a herd of deer grazed peacefully, oblivious to the impending danger. Then, a sudden shift in the air, a scent so putrid it clawed at my nostrils. The goat's distressed cries pierced the silence, signaling trouble. Peering through my optic, I witnessed a sight that chilled me to the bone. A figure emerged from the livestock pen, a grotesque silhouette against the moonlit snow. Naked, save for a coat of blood and fur, he carried a lifeless goat over his shoulder. Panic surged through me as I realized the gravity of the situation. With trembling hands I retreated to my truck, the icy grip of fear tightening around my heart. Starting the engine I cursed my misfortune remembering my earlier predicament in the snow. But this time, there was no hesitation. I blasted the lights, illuminating the darkness as I waited for dawn's salvation. Hours later, with the sun casting its golden light upon the landscape, I finally freed myself from the snowdrifts. Visiting the farmer, I concocted a tale of unsuccessful pursuit, masking the terror that still gripped my soul. Avoiding the farm in the days that followed, I couldn't shake the memory of that night. And as I watched my boss take on the shift I once dreaded, I couldn't help but wonder what horrors awaited him in the shadowed orchard. Perhaps the last guy before me knew something I didn't, something far more sinister than a pack of coyotes. The sun had dipped below the horizon when we finally arrived, the last light painting the Idaho mountains in a fiery blaze that made them look like they were burning. That's how I remember starting my journey into a world far removed from my own, a world where the past whispered in the winds and ancient traditions shaped the lives of those who lived by them. My name's not important, but the story I'm about to tell you, it changed me in ways I'm still trying to understand. I was 18, full of that kind of naive confidence that makes you think you can take on the world and win. She was different from anyone I'd ever met. Her laughter was like music, and her eyes held stories I could spend a lifetime unraveling. Her heritage was a badge of honor, 
worn with a quiet pride that intrigued me. When she invited me to visit her family's reservation in Pocatello, I didn't hesitate. I thought I was ready. I wasn't. The drive was long, the silence between us filled with anticipation and an unspoken anxiety about the reception of a white boy at the heart of her Native American community. We arrived under the cloak of twilight, the reservation a shadowed landscape of secrets and unspoken histories. Dinner that first night was an affair of warmth and subtle examination. Her father, a man whose presence commanded attention, wore his authority like the eagle feathers in his hair, naturally, and with a grace that belied the strength underneath. I was trying to tread lightly, aware of my outsider status, but curiosity got the better of me. I asked about wendigos and skinwalkers, words I had stumbled across in books, not fully understanding their weight in this world. The silence that followed was deafening. Forks paused mid-air, and eyes that were friendly moments before now appraised me with a new caution. Her father's voice, when it finally broke the silence, was even. We don't speak of those things at the table, he said. The topic was dropped, but the atmosphere had shifted. Later that night, he came to us. His steps were silent, but his presence filled the room. In the low light, he shared the lore of skinwalkers and wendigos, his voice a mix of reverence and warning. These were not just stories. They were lessons, histories, a part of his people's understanding of the world that was as real to him as the land we stood on. I listened, the weight of his words settling in my chest. There was a seriousness in his tone, a severity that made me swear to myself to never broach the subject again. Whether he meant to instill fear or respect, I couldn't tell. Perhaps it was a bit of both. But as I lay in bed that night, listening to the sounds of the reservation through the thin walls, I felt a shift within me. The stories had taken root, and I knew that ignorance, once shed, couldn't be donned again like an unwanted coat. I was on the edge of a vast, unseen world, peering into the darkness with newfound respect and a twinge of fear. As sleep finally claimed me, I realized that some doors, once opened, can never be closed. I had stepped through such a door, and my life would never be the same. Life has a way of moving on, sweeping you up in its current, and before I knew it, years had slipped by. The girl from the reservation became a chapter of my past, a memory tinged with wonder and a hint of regret. But life, as it does, brought me someone new someone who made me believe in second chances. We married in the kind of small ceremony that felt big in its intimacy, and not long after, we were expecting our first child. The future felt bright, like a path stretching out before us, lit by the promise of new beginnings. We decided on a camping trip before our duo turned into a trio, a final adventure, just for us. The destination was Affleck Park Campground, nestled in the Wasatch Mountains near Salt Lake City. The drive up was filled with laughter and the kind of easy conversation that comes when you're comfortable in each other's silence. We arrived to find the campground deserted, an unexpected solitude that wrapped around us like a cloak. It was perfect. The day faded into evening and we sat by the fire talking about everything and nothing, the kind of talk that fills the spaces between people. But as the fire died down, and we retreated into our tent. A sense of unease crept over me. It was nothing I could put my finger on, just a whisper of something off in the rustle of the trees and the too still air. I fell into a restless sleep, plagued by dreams that felt too real. I dreamed of the reservation, of the stories her father had told me, but the dream twisted into something darker. A presence circled our tent, a shadow among shadows, its intent malevolent. And then, it was inside, a creature of nightmare standing over us. It was the embodiment of every fear I'd tried to forget, a beast with eyes like molten gold, watching us with an intelligence that said it knew us, knew me. I lay there, pretending to sleep, my heart a thunderous beat in the silence. Morning came with the relief that it was all just a dream, but the relief was shallow, undercut by a dread I couldn't shake. My wife mentioned a strange dream of her own, but her reluctance to speak of it hung between us like a cloud. 
We packed up in haste, the unspoken decision to leave as quickly as possible hanging heavy in the air. The drive back was quiet, the landscape blurring past us, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of being known. It was as if the wilderness itself had peered into my soul and found something wanting. The stories of the skinwalkers and wendigos I had once dismissed as mere tales clung to me, a reminder of the thin veil between our world and one that was much older, much darker. That camping trip, meant to be a final hurrah before we embraced the future, became a haunting. The memory of that dream, of the creature with the yellow eyes, stayed with me, a ghostly presence at the edge of my thoughts. I had ventured once again into a realm I didn't understand, and this time, I wasn't sure I could ever leave it behind. The thing about the past is it doesn't always stay where it belongs. Sometimes, it follows you, creeping into your present with the stealth of a predator. That's what happened to me. I thought I'd left the stories and fears of skinwalkers and wendigos back on the reservation, buried under layers of life and change. But like roots in dry ground, they found a way to surface, especially after that camping trip in the Wasatch Mountains. Back in the swing of daily life, the weight of impending fatherhood on my shoulders, I found myself more introspective. The world seemed different now, shaded by the knowledge of things unseen and powers untold. It was a feeling I couldn't shake, a persistent nudge at the back of my mind that said the world was much more than it appeared. Then, during a break at a construction site, a co-worker brought up the topic of skinwalkers and wendigos in a conversation about local legends. The mention of those words was like a cold hand gripping my heart. I felt every hair on my body stand on end, and the air seemed to thicken around me. Memories of the camping trip flooded back with a visceral clarity, the dream of the black creature with yellow eyes haunting me once again. It was irrational, I told myself. Just old stories meant to scare children. But deep down, I knew it was more than that. I had felt it, lived it. I spent days, then weeks, trying to rationalize my fears, to bury them under the logic of the visible, tangible world I worked in every day. But the foundation of my skepticism had cracked, revealing a glimpse into a world where logic didn't apply, where ancient beings moved in the shadows, unseen but felt. I began to look for answers, delving into books, and seeking out those with knowledge of Native American folklore. What I found didn't comfort me. Instead, it deepened the sense of unease. These stories, these entities, were not just tales. They were a part of the fabric of the world, acknowledged and respected by those who knew of their existence. The more I learned, the more I realized how little I understood. It was during one of those long nights of research that I came to a realization. The encounter, whether it was a dream or something more, had changed me. It had forced me to confront the possibility that the world was broader, deeper, and more mysterious than I had ever imagined. It made me question the nature of reality and my place within it. I understood then that some encounters leave indelible marks on your soul. They challenge you to expand your understanding, to accept that there are things beyond the realm of our knowledge. That night in the Wasatch Mountains, whether it was a visitation from a skinwalker, a message from the spirit world, or simply a manifestation of my fears had left such a mark on me. In the end, I found a certain peace in my search for understanding. I accepted that there would always be mysteries, forces beyond my control or comprehension, but rather than fear them, I chose to respect them, to live my life with an awareness of the shadows and the light. And as I awaited the arrival of my child, I knew I would pass on this respect, this acknowledgement of the unseen world, as a part of their heritage. After all, we are all part of a larger story, woven together by threads seen and unseen. Ever since that eerie night two years ago in the Mark Twain forest, my life took a turn I never expected. Most people spend their weekends hanging out with friends or catching up on TV shows. Me? I dive deep into the world of Bigfoot research, 
Yeah, you heard that right. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the elusive forest giant, whatever you want to call it, I'm on its trail. It all started under the dense canopies of southern Missouri. One moment I was just a regular guy, and the next, I was a Bigfoot enthusiast, combing through every piece of evidence I could find on the internet. I joined forums, read books, and watched documentaries. You name it, I've seen it. My obsession even spread to neighboring states, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. If there was a sighting or theory about Bigfoot, I was all over it. My friend Jay, on the other hand, was more of a skeptic. But even he couldn't ignore the pull of adventure when I shared my plan to camp in the Cascades of western Washington. It was a spot known for Bigfoot sightings, and I had a gut feeling this was our chance to witness something extraordinary. We're really doing this, huh? Jay asked as we packed our gear into the back of my old Jeep. I grinned, loading the last of our supplies. You know it. This is our best shot at proving Bigfoot isn't just a legend. The drive was long, but the excitement buzzing between us made it fly by. We talked strategies and shared theories, each mile bringing us closer to the unknown. When we finally arrived, the secluded beauty of the lake took our breath away. Nestled in the Cascades, it was as if we had stepped into another world, a world where the possibility of Bigfoot seemed all the more real. Setting up camp was a breeze, or so we thought, until a mountain lion casually strolled by. We froze, watching in silent awe as it passed, oblivious to our presence. Welcome to the wild, Jay joked, but I could tell he was shaken. So was I. It was a stark reminder that we weren't alone out here. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the campsite, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and unease. What if we actually encountered Bigfoot? The thought sent shivers down my spine. That night, as we sat by the fire, the forest around us seemed to come alive. Every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves made us turn, half expecting to see a giant figure emerge from the darkness. But it was the distant screams that truly unnerved us. They echoed through the trees, a haunting sound that neither of us could place. Probably just a large cat, I tried to reassure Jay, but my voice betrayed my fear. We retreated to our tents, the unease settling over us like a thick blanket. Lying there, listening to the sounds of the night, I wondered if we were truly prepared for what lay ahead. The excitement of the chase was one thing, but facing the reality of Bigfoot was another. As sleep finally claimed me, I couldn't shake the feeling that our adventure was only just beginning. The next morning, Jay and I woke up with the sunrise, the previous night's eerie screams still echoing in our minds. We had come too far to let fear get the best of us, so we decided to start our day with a hike. Our goal was simple. Find any sign that Bigfoot was more than just a myth. The forest was alive with the sounds of nature as we set out, our boots crunching on the underbrush. We talked less than usual, our senses heightened as we searched for anything out of the ordinary. That's when we stumbled upon it, a strange structure made from broken trees arranged into an X. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen, perfectly constructed and unmistakably deliberate. Could this be... Jay trailed off the skepticism in his voice replaced by wonder. I nodded, my heart racing. It has to be. Some researchers think these structures could be a way Bigfoot marks its territory. We took our time examining the site, taking pictures with our phones and making notes. The discovery breathed new life into our quest, dispelling the lingering fear from the night's unsettling sounds. As the day wore on, we continued our exploration, fueled by the adrenaline of our find. But despite our efforts, we found no further evidence. The forest kept its secrets, and by the time we returned to camp, doubt had begun to creep back in. Had we let our imaginations get the best of us? The sun began to set, painting the sky with streaks of orange and pink. The beauty of it all was almost enough to make us forget why we were there. Almost. But as darkness enveloped the forest once more, a palpable tension settled over us. We decided to stay up late 
hoping to hear more sounds, or maybe, just maybe, catch a glimpse of the elusive creature. We sat by the fire, speaking in hushed tones about what the structure could mean, about Bigfoot, and about what we hoped to achieve. Then it happened again. The screams pierced the night, closer this time, chilling me to the bone. We both jumped up, scanning the dark tree line, but saw nothing. The forest had gone eerily silent, as if holding its breath. It's gotta be a big cat, I said again, more to convince myself than Jay. Yeah, maybe, he replied, but the uncertainty in his voice was clear. We retreated to our tents with heavy hearts, the excitement of the day overshadowed by the fear of the unknown. As I lay in my sleeping bag, listening to the sounds of the night, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The screams had sounded almost human, filled with an emotion that I couldn't quite place. Fear, anger, a warning. Sleep was elusive, my mind racing with possibilities. What if Bigfoot was real, and we were on the verge of discovering something amazing? Or what if we were simply out of our depth, chasing shadows in the dark? The night stretched on, a test of our resolve. And as I finally drifted off to sleep, I couldn't help but wonder what the next day would bring. Our adventure was far from over, and something told me that the biggest challenges were yet to come. The night was darker than any I'd ever known, the kind of dark that feels almost solid, like you could reach out and touch it. Jay and I had tried to stay awake, alert for any signs of Bigfoot, but the exhaustion from our day's hike had eventually won us over. Sometime during the night, I drifted into a restless sleep, filled with dreams of shadows moving just beyond the light of our campfire. I awoke with a start, my heart pounding. The silence of the forest was oppressive, as if it was holding its breath. Then, without warning, my world turned into chaos. My tent was collapsing around me, the fabric pressing down with a force that left me gasping for air. Panic surged through me as I realized something was dragging me across the ground, my body bouncing over rocks and twigs. I screamed for Jay, my voice lost amidst the sounds of my own terror. Suddenly, I was airborne, flying through the night before crashing into the icy cold of the lake. The shock of the water forced the air from my lungs, and I struggled to surface, my clothes and sleeping bag dragging me down. I fought my way to the top, coughing and spluttering, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Then I heard it, a scream, not mine this time, but Jay's. His voice was filled with terror, a sound I'd never heard from him before. Moments later, his tent flew past me, landing with a splash not far away. I scrambled to the shore, my mind racing. What had attacked us? Was it Bigfoot? Or something even more unimaginable? The night was still as I made my way back to camp, the fire reduced to glowing embers. I heard sobbing and found Jay huddled near the fire, his face a mask of fear. It grabbed the tent. I saw it, just for a second. It was huge, covered in hair, he managed between sobs. We huddled together by the dying fire, too scared to move, too cold to sleep. The hours until dawn were the longest of my life, every shadow a potential threat, every sound a possible danger. As the first light of dawn broke through the trees, we ventured out to assess the damage. Our tents and gear were ruined, but we were alive. The reality of our situation set in. We had come looking for Bigfoot and found more than we bargained for. The fear of the night gave way to a determination to leave this place, to escape the terror that lurked in the shadows. We packed what little we could salvage and began the treacherous journey back to civilization. Every noise made us jump, every movement in the forest a reminder of our vulnerability. But we pushed on, driven by the need to put as much distance as possible between us and the nightmare we had experienced. As we drove away from the Cascades, the forest receding in the rearview mirror, I couldn't help but feel a mix of relief and disappointment. We had survived, but at what cost? Our quest for evidence of Bigfoot had ended in terror, leaving us with more questions than answers. But one thing was clear. The wilderness held secrets, secrets that were better left undiscovered. 
and as much as I wanted to believe in the existence of Bigfoot, I now knew that some mysteries were too dangerous to pursue. Our encounter in the forest would haunt us for the rest of our lives, a chilling reminder of the night we came face to face with the unknown. As the first rays of sunlight pierced through the dense canopy of the Cascades, Jay and I sat in silence, our clothes still damp and our spirits shattered. The terror of the previous night lingered like a bad dream, refusing to fade away. We had come in search of Bigfoot, armed with curiosity and a thirst for adventure, but we left with a profound respect for the mysteries of the wild, some of which were better left alone. The journey back to our car was a somber one. Each step took us further away from the nightmare, but the memories of what we experienced clung to us, as persistent as the mud on our boots. We talked little, each lost in our thoughts, processing the events in our own way. When we finally reached the safety of our vehicle, the reality of our ordeal hit me. We had survived, but at what cost? Our gear was destroyed, our evidence lost to the waters of the lake, and our sense of security in the wilderness was forever shattered. The physical scars would heal, but the psychological wounds would take much longer to fade. As we drove away, leaving the forest and its secrets behind, I couldn't help but feel a mixture of emotions. There was relief, certainly, at being back in the familiar comfort of civilization, but there was also a sense of loss, a mourning for the innocence we had left behind in those woods. The drive home was a time for reflection. Jay and I discussed what had happened, turning over every detail in our minds, trying to make sense of it all. We debated the possibility of what we had encountered, knowing that without physical evidence, our story would be met with skepticism and disbelief. It was a hard pill to swallow. We had sought to uncover the truth about Bigfoot, to bring evidence to light that would silence the skeptics once and for all. Instead, we returned with nothing but our shaken faith and a story that sounded too wild to be true. In the days that followed, our adventure became a distant memory, talked about in hushed tones and met with raised eyebrows. Some people laughed, others offered sympathy, but most simply didn't believe us. It was frustrating, but I couldn't blame them. If I hadn't lived it, I wouldn't have believed it either. Yet, despite everything, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had touched the edge of a great mystery, a secret that the wilderness was not ready to reveal. The experience had changed us, opened our eyes to the possibilities that lay beyond the realm of the known. Bigfoot might have remained elusive, but the adventure had awakened a hunger for discovery that couldn't be satisfied by conventional answers. As time passed, the fear and uncertainty of that night in the Cascades faded, replaced by a sense of wonder and a desire to explore the unknown. I knew that one day, I would return to the wilderness, perhaps not in search of Bigfoot, but with an open mind and a respect for the mysteries that dwell in the heart of the forest. For now, though, I was content to let the mystery of Bigfoot remain just that, a mystery. After all, some secrets are best left undiscovered, hidden away in the shadows of the wild, waiting for the next brave soul to seek them out. The old building I work in has a history steeped in stories of its past, once a courthouse and a temporary holding facility for inmates. With its myriad of upgrades over the years, it still carries echoes of its former life. As I sit at my desk in the early morning, the building is eerily quiet, save for the occasional creaks and bangs that resonate through its halls. A recent addition to the building is a new water fountain equipped with modern features like the ability to fill water mugs and a push bar for direct drinking. From my desk, I have a clear view of this fountain, and I often leave my office door ajar to maintain a sense of connection with the rest of the building. It's not uncommon for me to arrive before the rest of the offices open at 9 a.m. During this solitary hour, strange occurrences have become almost routine. I've grown accustomed to the subtle noises from upstairs, the mysterious cold spots, and even the occasional murmur that seems to emanate from nowhere. Across the hall from my office sits the elevator, another source of unexplained noises. One day the emergency phone inside it began to ring, startling me from my work. 
I hurried over, expecting some technical glitch, only to hear the voice of a dispatcher on the other end, claiming that someone had just called 911 from within the elevator. Confused, I assured them that the building was empty, save for myself, and that there was no cause for alarm. But it was the water fountain that truly captured my attention with its inexplicable behavior. Despite its motion activation, one morning, I heard the sound of water running. I glanced up to find the automatic dispenser pouring water into an invisible vessel. Confused, I approached and waved my hand, expecting it to stop. Yet, the water continued to flow, defying all logic. Even pushing the bar yielded no results. It was as if some unseen presence controlled its actions. In a moment of frustration, I addressed the empty room, suggesting that the water would stop when it was ready. To my surprise, as soon as I turned away, the flow ceased abruptly. I returned to my desk, unnerved but not entirely frightened. Later that day, I reported the anomaly to the maintenance team, hoping for a rational explanation. Yet, despite their thorough investigation, they found nothing amiss with the fountain. The mysterious phenomenon persisted, occurring randomly but consistently at 8.17 a.m. I delved into research, trying to uncover any connection to the building's past or its former occupants, but my efforts proved fruitless. Left with no answers, I eventually resigned myself to the peculiar ritual. Now when the water fountain springs to life each morning, I greet it with a simple, good morning, a gesture of camaraderie with whatever unseen force lingers within the old building's walls. When I was about 13 years old, I used to spend a lot of time at the barn, riding horses. It was something I loved to do, and I even started working there when I was only 11. My parents were fine with it because it seemed safe enough. There were always older girls or adult owners around, and the barn was located in a secure area of town. The property layout was familiar to me. At the front, there was the house where the owners lived. The driveway passed right by the house, offering a glimpse into their lives. Beyond that, at the other end of the pastures, was a public park where we had permission to bring the horses. One particular night stands out vividly in my memory. It was winter, and darkness had already descended early. The cold seemed to seep into the barn, which wasn't heated, chilling me to the bone. My friend, who also rode at the barn, had agreed to stay with me since the older girl I was scheduled to work with had gone home sick. As we finished up feeding the horses and sweeping the aisles, we heard the creak of the doors to the indoor arena shutting. Initially we dismissed it, assuming it was the owner's son or his friend who had been in the barn earlier. Perhaps they had returned. But then, we started hearing footsteps and shuffling around the corner. While giving the last horse its hay, I heard the arena door creak open again. A sense of unease began to settle over me. My friend and I exchanged nervous glances. We decided to investigate, cautiously making our way around the corner towards the main aisle where the indoor arena doors were located. As we approached, my apprehension grew. The owner's son and his friend were nowhere to be seen. We entertained the possibility that perhaps one of the doors leading outside from the arena had been left open accidentally, allowing the wind to cause them to creak. But when we checked, all the doors were securely shut. Using the flashlight on my phone, we peered into the pitch black arena, straining to see if the boys were playing a prank on us. Suddenly, footsteps echoed in the barn aisle, accompanied by ominous clattering and banging against the walls. My heart pounded, and I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. Checking my phone for any messages from my parents, who should have been arriving soon to pick us up, I noticed the horses becoming agitated, pacing in their stalls and snorting angrily. Panic began to rise within me. Without exchanging words, my friend and I knew we had to get out of there. Turning off my flashlight, we tiptoed back into the barn, attempting to remain unseen. But when I caught sight of a shadow turning the corner at the back of the barn, I couldn't contain my fear any longer. Grabbing my friend's arm, I bolted towards the barn entrance. The cold air outside hit us like a slap in the face, but I didn't care. I just wanted to be away from that barn. 
we huddled together against the wall, waiting anxiously for my parents to arrive. When their headlights finally appeared, relief washed over me. As we climbed into the warmth of the car, we tried to laugh off the experience, chalking it up to the owner's son playing a prank on us. But when we drove past the owner's house and saw them all inside, my heart skipped a beat. The realization dawned on us that we had been alone in that barn. The rest of the night was spent trying to make sense of what had happened. Was it a ghost haunting the barn, as the older girls had claimed? Or had someone else been there with us lurking in the shadows? The uncertainty left a knot in my stomach, and looking back now, I realize how dangerous the situation had been. My parents would never have allowed their 13-year-old daughter to be alone in the barn late at night. It was a lesson learned the hard way. You never know what dangers may be lurking in the darkness. In the remote corners of northern Canada, where the vast wilderness meets the border with the United States, stories echo through the generations. Tales of skinwalkers, ghostly apparitions, and encrypted enigmas linger in the air, passed down from elders to the curious youth. I've had my share of inexplicable encounters with the supernatural, leaving an indelible mark on my understanding of the world. Yet one night in particular stands out among the rest. It was a chilling evening in October of 2010. Our small Canadian community was shrouded and surrounded by woods, threaded by narrow trails navigable only by ATVs or the adventurous souls on foot. It was a place where the veil between the seen and unseen felt thinner than anywhere else. On that fateful night, my friends Oaks, Day and I decided to tread the road notorious for its dark history, snaking through the wilderness for three eerie miles. The road lacked the comfort of a single street lamp, and legends swirled around it. Whisperings of hitchhiking ghosts, the haunting hoof lady, and the elusive Sasquatch. As darkness cloaked the landscape and the clock struck 8 p.m., we impulsively decided to traverse this haunting stretch of land. Our supplies were minimal, a solitary flashlight, coats to ward off the chilling air, and our own company. Oaks and Day were fervent in their anticipation, recounting tales of spectral encounters from their family lore. But for me, a sense of dread loomed over this escapade. Stories of disappearances and inexplicable phenomena had instilled a deep-seated fear of the unknown. As we approached the forest edge, the road lay ahead faintly illuminated by passing vehicles. The sight provided a sliver of reassurance amidst the encroaching darkness. Day held the flashlight, its beam withheld for reasons unknown while my friend's boisterous chatter sought to mask the unsettling silence. Minutes dragged like hours, each step amplifying the quiet unease that had settled within me. About halfway along the road stood an abandoned farmstead, a decrepit relic of the past. Oaks, fueled by curiosity, proposed exploring its crumbling interiors. Instinctively, I opposed the idea, urging a swift return home. Yet, as we drew closer to the derelict farmhouse, Day's sudden gasp shattered the night's tranquility. She claimed to have seen a flickering light inside the lonely structure. Dismissing it as a prank, Oakes laughed playfully, chiding her. But a creeping sense of dread gripped us, as we witnessed a faint glow within the supposedly deserted homestead. It's impossible, Day whispered, her voice tinged with disbelief. I too recoiled in horror, my mind racing through a spectrum of possibilities. Was it an apparition, an evil force, or something beyond comprehension? I demanded Day to illuminate the area with the flashlight, yet she hesitated. Fed up with the eerie charade, I voiced my urgency to leave. Peering toward the farmhouse, Oakes confirmed this was impossible. There was a glimmer of light. Without a second thought, I turned on my heels marching briskly back towards home. Day and Oaks stumbled to catch up as my pace quickened. My mind raced with frantic thoughts, regretting not bringing my four-wheeler or a cell phone for emergency contact. The flickering light in the farmhouse haunted my imagination, conjuring sinister possibilities. Was it a spectral entity, an evil presence, or perhaps something more extraterrestrial? 
The pounding of our footsteps reverberated through the night until abruptly, I realized the eerie absence of my friend's hurried steps behind me. A gnawing sense of dread compelled me to glance back. To my horror, Oaks had fallen, sprawled on the ground, while Day's panicked cry pierced the night. Her terrified shriek drew me toward the farmhouse, now engulfed in an inexplicable phenomenon. A ball of fire, akin to a dancing flame, emerged within the decrepit structure, seemingly pulsating with an unearthly energy. It ascended and perched atop the farmhouse, casting an otherworldly glow upon the night. It felt sentient, as if its fiery gaze fixated on our fleeing figures. Propelled by sheer terror, Oaks bolted up bright and sprinted, urging us to follow suit. We plunged into the woods, the haunting light of the fiery apparition still visible, a surreal and terrifying spectacle that defied rational explanation. The relentless pursuit continued as we fled the winding trails, the luminous enigma of the fireball remaining tethered to the abandoned house. Panic-stricken and breathless, we sought refuge at Oaks's grandparents' house. Desperation etched on our faces as we recounted the surreal encounter. Their elderly voices carried wisdom steeped in folklore, soothing our frayed nerves with tales of fireballs, a harbinger, a spectral messenger rather than an evil omen. The reassurance and stories attempted to quell our fear. Before we departed for our respective homes, the lingering enigma of the fiery apparition still haunted our thoughts. Days passed, but the memory of the unearthly spectacle lingered. The cryptic words of Oak's grandparents reverberated, resonating with an inexplicable profundity. It wasn't until the untimely passing of an elder in our community, just three days after our chilling encounter, that the pieces began to fall into place. The farmhouse, long abandoned by its owners, had once been the home of a grandfather who had departed from this realm. The fiery apparition we had encountered bore a message, a warning veiled in the dance of flames and otherworldly communication preceding the elder's passing. Though inexplicable and haunting, the spectral encounter left me pondering the mysteries of our world. It reminded me that beyond the veil of the known lies a realm of enigmas, where the supernatural and the ordinary intersect in inexplicable ways. The weight of my dead-end job pressed down on me like a suffocating blanket, each day dragging by in a haze of stress and frustration. Desperate for some respite, I made a rash decision to take a walk in the woods one night, hoping to find solace beneath the canopy of trees. Looking back, I realize how foolish it was. I hadn't told anyone where I was going, nor had I brought any form of protection. As I parked my car at a desolate rest stop and ventured onto the trail, a sense of isolation enveloped me. The darkness seemed to swallow every sound, leaving me alone with my thoughts. Trying to shake off the unease, I began to sing softly, a familiar melody that usually brought me comfort. But tonight, even my own voice felt hollow against the oppressive silence. With each step deeper into the woods, the atmosphere grew heavier. Every rustle of leaves sent shivers down my spine, and I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Panic began to claw at the edges of my mind as I quickened my pace. Yet the sensation of being followed persisted. Suddenly a voice shattered the stillness, calling out to me in desperation. It started as a faint whisper, barely audible above the rustling of leaves, but it quickly escalated into a frantic plea for help. I froze torn between instinctual fear and a nagging sense of duty. Hello, are you okay? I called out, my voice trembling. The voice grew louder, more urgent, pulling me towards it like a moth to a flame. Against my better judgment, I followed the sound, my heart hammering in my chest with each step. As I approached, I saw nothing but darkness, the source of the voice obscured by shadows. And then I saw them, Two glowing orbs of light fixated on me from the depths of the forest. Fear rooted me to the spot as I realized that something lurked in the darkness, something unseen yet undeniably present. My mind raced with possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. But before I could react, the voice fell silent, 
and a chill swept through the air. With a surge of adrenaline, I turned and ran, every fiber of my being screaming for escape. The pounding of my heart drowned out all other noise as I sprinted through the underbrush, branches clawing at my skin. Finally, I burst into a clearing, collapsing onto the ground in exhaustion. Relief washed over me as I realized the pursuit had ended, but it was quickly overshadowed by a gnawing sense of guilt. What if the voice had belonged to someone in genuine need? What if my fear had cost them their life? As I sat in my car, gazing out at the dark expanse of the woods, I couldn't shake the feeling that something still lingered out there, waiting. And though I tried to convince myself otherwise, deep down, I knew that the terror I had experienced was all too real. The steering wheel felt foreign under my hands as I guided my car along the winding path that led to Ohop Lake. Maybe it was the weight of expectation, the burden of finally taking a break after years chained to a desk, or perhaps the anticipation of what lay ahead. My job as an insurance broker, demanding as it was, hadn't prepared me for the jarring shift from urban chaos to the tranquil embrace of nature. I'd heard about Ohop Lake from a colleague, a place where the water mirrored the sky, and the forest held secrets in its silent depths. It sounded like a writer's paradise, a perfect retreat to chip away at the novel I had been nursing for what felt like a lifetime. My life had been a cycle of claims, premiums, and client meetings, leaving little room for creativity. This trip, prompted by a minor health scare that served as a wake-up call, was my reclaiming of time, lost to the grind. The cabin I rented online promised isolation and simplicity, two things I craved. As I drove, the dense canopy of trees swallowed the road behind me, severing ties with the outside world. My phone, rendered useless without a signal, lay forgotten on the passenger seat. It was just me, my thoughts, and the open road. The first glimpse of Ohop Lake through the trees was like stumbling upon a secret. The water was so clear it felt like looking into another world, one untouched by deadlines and stress. I parked my car near the cabin my home for the next week. It was smaller than I expected, but it fit the picture in my head. A secluded writer's nook nestled in the heart of nature. Gathering my belongings, which consisted of a few changes of clothes, toiletries, and most importantly my laptop, I approached the cabin. The key box, stubborn as it was, refused to budge. My frustration grew with each failed attempt to open it. The irony wasn't lost on me. Here I was, seeking a break from complications, only to be thwarted by a simple lock. Excuse me, I think you need to hold the last button down while you pull on the latch. Their box keeps getting stuck, and I've seen guests leave before because they couldn't get in. The voice came from behind me, a lifeline thrown in my moment of need. I turned to find a woman with striking red hair and green eyes, her smile a mix of amusement and empathy. Hey, that worked! Thank you, I managed to say, surprised by the sudden interaction. No trouble at all, and my name is Claudia, she introduced herself, her voice carrying the warmth of the afternoon sun. I'm Kyle, thanks again. I just got here and am a bit disoriented, I replied, cursing my awkwardness. Claudia's presence was a welcome interruption to my solitary plans. She mentioned she lived nearby and offered her help if I needed anything. As she walked away, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief. Maybe this trip wouldn't be so isolating after all. The cabin, with its musty scent and nautical theme, felt like stepping into another era. It was perfect. I placed my laptop on the patio table, the lake's view stretching before me, an endless source of inspiration. Time slipped by unnoticed as I wrote, the words flowing effortlessly for the first time in years. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a golden glow over the lake, I realized I had forgotten to bring food. Settling for canned soup and crackers, I watched the twilight envelop the lake. A sense of peace settled over me, a stark contrast to the usual buzz of the city. But as darkness fell, the tranquility of the lake was pierced by a strange phenomenon. A gout of water erupted from its center, followed by a brief flash of light. 
I rubbed my eyes, questioning if fatigue was playing tricks on me. I decided to dismiss it, attributing the sight to natural wonders I was too city-weary to understand. Little did I know, that decision, to overlook the oddity of that night, would come to haunt me in the days ahead. The secrets of Ohope Lake, as I would soon discover, were not as benign as I believed. The following morning greeted me with a mist that hung over Ohop Lake like a shroud, softening the world into a hazy watercolor. Despite the eerie calm, there was an undercurrent of something else, a subtle dissonance that set my nerves on edge. I attributed it to the novelty of my surroundings, a stark departure from the predictability of urban life. The artifact's discovery was as accidental as it was bizarre. A persistent, almost musical chiming had infiltrated my dreams, leading me to believe the sounds were remnants of a city I'd left behind. But the realization dawned with the morning light. The source was much closer, emanating from beneath the cabin itself. Curiosity, that relentless driver, propelled me to investigate. Armed with a flashlight, I found the access point to a crawl space a forgotten nook beneath the structure that felt like the entrance to another world. The air was cold, laced with the musty scent of earth and decay. I could hear my own breathing, a loud intruder in the silent darkness. The sound guided me, a chiming that grew louder, more insistent, as I navigated the cramped underbelly of the cabin. And then, my hands brushed against something unexpected. It was a box, carved with intricate designs that seemed to dance in the beam of my flashlight. The craftsmanship was unlike anything I'd ever seen, depicting creatures of the sea in a lifelike relief that seemed to pulse with a life of its own. Opening the box revealed its contents, an object resembling a tuning fork, but its materials and design were alien to me. It was as if the sea and the stars had conspired to craft it, blending natural and unnatural elements into a harmonious whole. The chime, I realized, emanated from this artifact, a call that was both alluring and unsettling. The decision to take the artifact closer to the lake felt instinctual, driven by a compulsion I couldn't explain. As I approached the water's edge, the chime intensified, vibrating through my bones. It was then that I noticed the glow, a lambent light emanating from the artifact, mirrored by the lake itself, the connection between the two was undeniable, a magnetic pull that I was powerless to resist. In a moment that would forever alter the course of my life, I stumbled, sending the artifact skittering into the lake. The sound that followed was otherworldly, a chorus of chimes that crescendoed into a cacophony. The water churned as if agitated by a great force, and then, as quickly as it had begun, the lake fell silent the artifact swallowed by its depths. The aftermath left me reeling, my mind struggling to piece together the surreal events. The tranquility of Ohop Lake had been a facade, concealing mysteries beyond my comprehension. The artifact, with its inexplicable connection to the lake, had unlocked something ancient, something that, I feared, was not meant to be disturbed. As I stood at the water's edge, the reality of what I had unleashed began to sink in. The artifact was gone, but its absence left a void filled with ominous possibilities. The serene landscape that had once promised solace now hinted at hidden dangers, and the weight of my actions bore down on me with the heaviness of the mist-shrouded morning. The lake had changed, and with it, my understanding of the world. I had tapped into something primal and uncontrollable, igniting a chain of events that I could neither predict nor comprehend. The only certainty was the unsettling feeling that the story of Ohop Lake and the artifact was far from over. The serenity of the previous days at Ohop Lake felt like a distant memory, replaced now by an atmosphere charged with tension and unease. The night had brought with it a silence so profound it felt as though the natural world itself was holding its breath, waiting for something unimaginable to break free. The day had started innocently enough with Claudia and I exchanging wary glances over coffee, both of us reluctant to voice our fears about the previous night's events. The artifact, now lost to the depths of the lake, had become a harbinger of unknown terrors, its purpose and power as murky as the waters that concealed it. 
Our uneasy truce with the silence was shattered by the discovery of the deer. The scene was grotesque, a violent tableau that seemed out of place amidst the tranquil beauty of the surrounding forest. The animals had been torn apart with such ferocity, it was as if the very essence of savagery had descended upon them. Claudia, her face pale with shock, whispered what we were both thinking. This wasn't the work of any predator known to these woods. As the day wore on, the sense of foreboding grew. The forest, once alive with the sounds of birds and rustling leaves, now lay in oppressive stillness. The air felt charged, heavy with anticipation. It was as if the very landscape of Ohop Lake had been transformed, twisted into a realm where only fear thrived. The assault on Claudia's home came with the night. It was as if darkness itself had taken form, a malevolent force that sought to invade and destroy. The creature, invisible yet undeniably present, unleashed its fury upon the house, its attacks a terrifying cacophony of destruction. Inside, Claudia and I scrambled for any means of defense, our minds racing to comprehend the nature of our unseen assailant. The reflections in the shattered glass and mirrors around us offered glimpses of the horror that hunted us. An entity of nightmares, a mass of shadows and malice that defied understanding. Our battle was one of desperation and instinct. I remember the feel of the bare mace in my hand, a feeble weapon against such an adversary, yet it was all we had. The decision to fight, to stand our ground against the onslaught, was made in the silence that fell between us. A mutual understanding that to flee was to accept death. The creature's fury was relentless, but in a moment of sheer terror-fueled courage, I managed to strike. The bear mace, directed towards the vague shape that terrorized us, seemed to have an effect, a brief reprieve in the nightmare that allowed us to escape into the night. As we fled Claudia's home, the realization of what we had faced began to dawn on me. This was no mere animal, no simple predator. This was something else, something ancient and malevolent, awakened by my unwitting hand from the depths of the lake. Our escape from the house was a blur of fear and adrenaline, the woods around us alive with the sounds of pursuit. The creature, though wounded, was relentless its presence a palpable force that drove us to the brink of despair. In those moments of flight, the world reduced to the space between heartbeats, I understood the true nature of terror. It was not simply the fear of death, but the realization of our own insignificance in the face of such primordial darkness. The artifact, the creature, the lake itself, these were elements of a story much older and darker than any I could have imagined. As we made our escape, the night around us seemed to close in, a tangible reminder of the horror we had unleashed. Ohop Lake, with its hidden depths and ancient secrets, had become a place of nightmares, a landscape transformed by the terror that now roamed its shores. The drive away from Ohop Lake was a flight through a corridor of darkness, with the shadows of the trees on either side seeming to reach out for us as if trying to pull us back towards the nightmare we had just escaped. The rearview mirror reflected a world I no longer recognized, one where the natural beauty of the landscape had been overshadowed by the horror of the events we had survived. Claudia sat beside me, her body trembling with shock and cold, wrapped in a blanket that did little to ward off the chill that had settled deep in our bones. Our conversation was sparse, limited to the necessities of our escape. The weight of our shared experience hung between us, a barrier as tangible as the darkness outside. The silence of the drive was a stark contrast to the cacophony of terror we had left behind. My mind replayed the events in a relentless loop, each detail etched with vivid clarity. The creature, its form revealed only in fleeting reflections, had been a thing of nightmares, a monstrous embodiment of the ancient and malevolent forces that lay hidden beneath the serene surface of Ohop Lake. Our escape was not a victory, but a desperate bid for survival. The sounds of the creature's pursuit had faded into the distance, but the fear it had instilled in us was a constant companion. The realization that we had disturbed something ancient and powerful at the lake was a weight that pressed heavily on my conscience. The artifact, 
with its mysterious origins and unknown purpose, had been the key to unleashing a horror that should have remained hidden. As dawn broke, painting the sky with the first light of morning, the reality of our situation began to settle in. We were alive, but at what cost? The destruction of Claudia's home, the loss of her aunt, and the death of Thomas, the neighbor who had tried to help us, were wounds that would not easily heal. The trauma of the night's events was a shadow that would follow us, a reminder of the fragility of our understanding of the world. The aftermath of our ordeal at O'Hope Lake was a time of reflection and recovery. The questions that plagued us were many, but answers were scarce. What had been the purpose of the artifact? Had the creature been a guardian of some ancient secret, or simply a monster awakened from its slumber? The lake, with its hidden depths and untold mysteries, held the answers, but they were secrets that I no longer wish to uncover. The story of our escape from Ohop Lake would be one that few would believe. The tale of an ancient artifact, a monstrous creature, and a night of terror seemed like the stuff of fiction, yet we had lived it. The warning we could offer was simple. Some mysteries are better left undisturbed, especially those that lie hidden in the depths of places like Ohop Lake. As we drove into the embrace of the coming day, leaving the shadows of the lake behind us, I understood that our lives had been irrevocably changed. The innocence with which we had approached the world was lost, replaced by a wariness of the unseen and unknown forces that lay in wait. O oh, Hope Lake, with its beauty and terror, had taught us the cost of curiosity, a lesson we would carry with us forever. In the end, the peace we sought in the tranquility of nature had been an illusion, shattered by the reality of the darkness that lurked beneath. Our escape from Ohop Lake was not an end but a beginning, the first steps on a path that would lead us through the aftermath of our encounter with the unknown. The scars we bore were not just physical, but mental, a testament to the night when the natural world revealed its most unnatural secrets.